welcome Liz Plank, Tanya Venom, Ming Xing Wong, and Natalie Perez Morales. the producer to put my pen where I should sit, um, and, and it wasn't there yet. So that was uh, our, our amazing producer uh, behind the scenes making it all happen. I am so jazzed to be here at Makers. Wasn't this an amazing conference? <laughs> and Makers is amazing because it's all about building a better world for the future, and so we thought we would bring the future to you and, and hear from the future um, themselves. So we are joined by amazing Girl Up activists. Uh, if you don't know about Girl Up, Google it, um, look it up. It's one of the uh, greatest organizations out there that I'm so happy and proud to be on the board of. Um, and you know, when I was preparing for this um, amazing conversation, I was thinking about what the role of activism is, and that one of the definitions of being a really good activist is being a very good ancestor. And so this is going to be all about how to be better ancestors. And we want a Yelp review, we want your Yelp review. Even if it's a zero star Yelp review, we want you to be honest. What can we be doing better uh, for future uh, young girls who are going to be inhabiting this planet uh, with us? And so um, Natalia, Tanya, Ming Ching, um, let's, let's start it off um, by talking about sort of, I think, this contradiction that we have with young girls and teenage girls in our society, where there's almost this like hero savior complex where we expect you to solve all of the problems that, you know, sort of older generations have created, but then we also expect you to sometimes fit within a certain tradition and not do things too differently. Um, Tanya, I'm wondering, you know, does that uh, pressure, you know, how do you, how do you sort of deal with that and how can uh, we be better in terms of support? Supporting you so that we're not giving you these contradictory pressures. Yeah, so I think there definitely is a lot of pressure out there for us because, of course, it was so amazing to hear everyone speak yesterday and learn from all of you, and you've all paved an amazing path for us. But at the same time, it's difficult for us, for us to kind of deviate from what's happened in the past and create our own solutions to problems. So one example that um, we were discussing and we felt like wasn't maybe bring up, brought up <laughs> enough at the conference was climate change. And it's an issue that's affecting our generation for, sh for sure. And so if we could hear more and get more support from the older generation to create solutions and help support us in terms of finding solutions for climate change, that's definitely something we talked about as an example. Yeah, and climate change is such a, a great uh, point because you know we're seeing Greta Thunberg, for example, one of the many teenage girls out there literally changing the world. Um, she's being told to, you know, again, do things in a certain way, um, even though she's trying to come up with, you know, if, if we are to solve a huge problem like climate change, we really need radically different uh, positions. I'm, I'm curious what, what you think about that. Yeah, we were discussing how Greta Thunberg began her activism by skipping every Friday. Yeah. Um, and she received a lot of criticism for that, saying that she should be in school. That's where the learning happens. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like for something so important as climate change, there requires really radical action. And if skipping a day of school right. means being able to make a difference, um, that's the type of action that we need to see. And that's the type of action that we would love encouragement and support from. Yeah, skipping school is okay if you're changing the world, right? Um, yeah. That's a good, that's a good takeaway. Um, and so, Natalia, so much of your work is uh, at the intersection of so many different issues, right? Because as we know, and I think Makers does such a great job of uh, really having an intersectional lens on the issue of, of, of women and, and women's issues. Um, can you speak more about why you know, there is no feminism without intersectionality and how that plays into your work. Yeah, um, so I think it's important to stop viewing feminism as a them problem because we, we all know that women are more oppressed than men. It's obvious, it's a fact. But what if, but what if you're a woman of color? What if you're a woman of color from a low-income community? What if you're a woman of color from a low-income community and you grew up in an undocumented household so those are all very important identities to consider. And I think that trauma, there's a lot of layers to trauma. And <clears throat> I think 
um, like for example, I grew up um, in an immigrant household. I'm a woman of color, I'm Latina. So all those identities really um, determine how I approach feminism and the way that I approach feminism may be different than someone who grew up with privilege, um, like a white woman who maybe grew up with um, high income status. So I think it's important to consider that when thinking about feminism and I think inclusivity is key when approaching feminism. Yeah, that's a great point. Yes. And ming -Shin, we were talking, you know, sort of to piggyback off of that about privilege, too, and how, you know, th these are also co complicated, right, uh, questions, because your, your privilege can change depending on what room you're in. And, um, and so do you want to speak a little bit to, to that and how it applies to your work? Yeah, I think Natalia brought up a very good point about how there's a spectrum of it, like, there's a spectrum to the issues that we're talking about, mm -hmm. and that applies to privilege as well. Um, being in this room and being able to speak on a stage and speak about issues that I'm passionate about is a privilege in itself. And I feel like being able to attend this conference and be in a room where everyone is receptive to the things that I'm saying is a form of privilege as well. Mm -hmm. um, so recognizing the privilege that we have today being here um, is one step to being able to notice and being able to see that there's like a spectrum of like different issues and different actions that we can take to support people who don't necessarily come from the same maybe set of privileges that we have um, and how and analyze how we can uplift these other people as well. Yeah, yeah. that's so important. Um, and Mingxing, I wanted to also, you know, you do uh, so much work around period poverty um, and you know, this is a historic moment. Obviously, we're in the lead up to a very important election. Um, and this is the first time that, you know, our, our daughters are going to have less um, reproductive rights than, than their mothers did. And so I, I'm curious what it's like to exist in that kind of political environment. Um, and yeah, how, and, 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 and you know, we were talking before, right? Like, that we're talking about going back, right, to a year, a, a law that was passed uh, or a Supreme Court decision that was, you know, decided 50 years ago. And even that to you felt like, why are we even, why do we even want to go back to something? We should be reimagining something even better. So I'm curious, how does reproductive rights, um, you know, how, how can it be reimagined by your generation? Yeah, it's incredibly overwhelming thinking about the fact that abortion rights we had maybe just a year ago are being overturned and being removed. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, even before Roe v. Wade was overturned, um, my robotics team were a team of 50 all girls. Um, we decided to address the need for menstrual equity in our robotics organization. Um, it's a huge organization. There are thousands of teams around the world, mm -hmm. yet for a company that had a whole DEI team, there was no sort of, no one on the team was addressing menstrual equity and the fact that there were no menstrual products at any of our robotics competitions. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we did was we decided to begin bringing these products our, ourselves and bringing these to competitions because there were girls coming up to our team and saying, oh, like I recently bled through, like do you have pants I can borrow or do you have menstrual products that we can borrow? Um, so we started providing these products to a few competitions and it began spreading. Mm. Um, at one point, I think we were providing 3,000 products a year. There were 70 teams that were joining in our effort and helping us. Uh. Um, and that just opened my eyes to just how huge of a need menstrual equity and like the need for equal access to products. Mm. Um, it's a huge need. Even our school, like, last year was the first year our school decided to provide menstrual products in every single bathroom. That's incredible. Yeah, wow. and so there's a huge need that isn't being addressed in a lot of large organizations, and mm -hmm. especially in robotics where it's oftentimes a male-dominated field, yeah. um, there isn't a lot of attention being brought to these issues. I love that. Like, the meeting of, ro yes, um, <laughs> incredible. The meeting of robotics and menstrual products is, is just like, you don't often hear both of those words, those terms in one sentence, and I love, um, right, it, it, it's really reimagining it. Um, yes, Roe and abortion is, is important, but it's part of an entire spectrum of just normalizing women's bodies and not, um, you know, sort of, again, eroding that stigma and what you're doing is so, so impressive. Um, let's talk a little bit about therapy. I'm guessing, like, 
almost everybody in this room has been in some form of therapy, right? Whether it's a free 12-step program or group therapy at your school or work um, or individual therapy, it's become much more normalized, which I think is very uh, positive, even though we need to make it more accessible for all people. And I think so much about inner child work, right? We all see it on our Instagram feeds. We were talking about it at breakfast this morning um, about how to, you know, we should be loving our inner child more. And so much of this should be also about respecting our inner child and that if we respected children and we really, um, you know, sort of listened to, to, to them and, and, and believed them, maybe we wouldn't need to be doing all of this therapy because uh, we would revere, uh, you know, children and it's sort of that fundamental flaw of democracy that all of the laws that are being pa passed right now are impacting you know, the, the people who are most impacted are the people who can't vote. Um, and so I, I'm curious how you think about that, um, Tanya. Do you see um, th this kind of tension for a lot of uh, girls your age in terms of the activism that they're doing? I definitely think so, and I think it goes back to reproductive rights, what you were talking about before. I feel like it's really hard in today's day and age with so many kind of traditional beliefs in the past to figure out what we as girls believe in and really understand our individual voice, which is what we were talking about. Sometimes what our parents believe affect what we believe, and it's hard to figure out what really is right for us. And I've, I've seen that through some of my friends, and especially around abortion rights, it's difficult to figure out what, what to listen to and what, what to make of your thoughts and your ideas. So I think definitely there's that pressure to figure out our own voices. And, yeah. yeah, and what's a good, what, 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 what could be something that someone, like a, a woman out here, you know, who are listening and, and watching online can sort of ask you or do to support so that you can really figure out and, and be comfortable exploring your own perspective on things? Well, I think, it, I think it goes back to since we had the opportunity to really hear all of the women yesterday. I think one thing that Ms. LaFonce of Butler said yesterday was we're replicating the 1800s is not a solution to the problems we're facing today. Yeah. And I think if more girls heard that and more girls were exposed to conferences like this and had the opportunity to hear from people like all of you, it could really help us form our own beliefs and you know, under, understand what our voices, what, what we should believe in. Yeah, that's incredible, I love that. Um, okay, let's pivot to mental health, which is, I mean, not that much of a pivot, we were talking about therapy. But you know, mental health is on the minds of everybody. Um, and I know, you know, when I was growing up, you know, danger was kind of outside of, uh, you know, it, it was stranger danger, it was drugs, alcohol, and, and now, obviously, those things are still around, but, you know, danger is kind of in the palm of your hand, right? You, cell phones and, and iPhones, um, cell phones and iPhones. I sound old. Um, I uh, am aging myself. Um, the uh, Blackberry, you know, that we all have. No, so, you know, the, this technology uh, is also coming with all kinds of information and it allows you to be politically engaged and it's incredible. At the same time, it's also creating a lot of health issues for your, for your generation. Um, Natalia, can you share, you know, how you handle that tension between wanting to use social media for good, but then also, you know, sort of protecting yourself from uh, how it can be a, a also a dangerous force? Yeah, um, so on the topic of inner child, um, I think uh, my therapist had me do an activity where I drew a house in a tree. And through those two drawings, I, I don't know, she like overanalyzed me and she learned so much <laughs> about me <laughs> that I didn't even know about myself. And um, we started talking about body image and I think that a lot of times we think, um, we tell ourselves, think about um, the little version of yourself. How would, how, would, um, how would they feel if you told yourself this? But I think the inner child, my inner child is hurt because I was so affected by negative um, societal standards. Um, and I think that men don't experience them the same way that women do. Because as women, we're told that um, having a small waist is better, or um, having like what people describe as an hourglass figure, that that's more desirable and that's what beauty is. And I think it's, that's something that's really affected the younger generation. And um, now 11 year olds are thinking about what they look like rather than, I don't know, like doing their homework. I know that in middle school I was really affected by um, my negative body image, and I think that it's not something that women, um, little girls should be worrying about, and it's just so sad to think about, um, and I just wish it, something would change, and I think um, social media really has played a major factor 
into negative body image. Um, and I, I think that as older women, it's important to check in on younger women and ask them how they're doing. Because just because someone looks okay doesn't mean that they are. Um, so they could be fighting a battle with, from within, and I think it's important to check in on each other. Mm, yeah, such a good point. Um, bouncing off of Natalia's point, um, I think I recently read somewhere that teens on average spend about seven hours on their phone per day, um, which is a huge portion of how, like, your 24 hours. Um, and I think a huge reason is because social media is just becoming more prevalent, technology is becoming more prevalent. Um, but also, like, social media feeds into a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression. Um, especially with all the news that's been happening, it's so easy, so easily accessible on social media, and I feel like a part of that is the reason why, especially during COVID, when we're on our phones all day, on social media all day, um, girls especially were disproportionately affected by social media, and like, they saw huge stats in mental health um, and just the number of hospitalizations. Um, and so there can be a lot done in terms of educating the youth about how to use social media more effectively and how to use it and find that balance. I know it can be a huge, powerful t tool for change, but yet there are a lot of negative effects that come with using social media daily. And so I think there are a lot that, can be, that we can be teaching the youth about echo chambers and how to find our own voice within social media um, and how to take that cleanse when Maybe it's just too much. Per day. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. such a great. Sorry. And I think yeah. um, yesterday, yesterday, a lot of a lot of the leaders who spoke talked about self care and the importance of self care. And I think it's definitely good to keep talking about that and going back to it, especially when it comes to body image issues and the use of social media. So I think that conversation should keep going about how what what the most what the best methods are to finding one's self care. Yeah, self care. <laughs> So crucial. We're all still trying. Um, it, it, self care shouldn't be like another thing to be perfect at, though. I think a lot of us, again, yeah. you grew up as a woman and you're perfectionist. It can be like this other thing you have to do really well. But um, I, you know, t your word cleanse, like taking a digital cleanse, I think is um, really, really important to prevent burnout. Um, we are almost to our close. Um, this was so, so um, nutritious. I feel like we got so much out of um, your time with us. I want to close with um, a question that I'm curious about. So can you tell us, with your elders here um, in front of you listening, what's something that you learned from them and what's something that you want to do differently? Who wants to go first? Me on the spot. <laughs> um, definitely learned a tremendous amount about how the issues that we're all tackling definitely shouldn't be individually separated. There is a type of like togetherness that comes with fighting for issues. There shouldn't be just one issue that you're focusing on. Yeah. Rather, just blending them together and seeing how we can support women in different areas okay. and how we can uplift everyone together to fight for feminism and fight for equal rights and equity and things like that. Um, in terms of what we could be doing better, mm -hmm. um, some of my best opportunities have come from women taking a chance on me and mm -hmm. seeing the value in what a young woman can be doing and bringing to the table. Yeah. So I would urge all of you to take the chance on the youth and realize that we have a lot of value and a lot of uni unique insight that mm -hmm. we could be bringing. Um, and it's easy to look at us and see like a young girl who might not know the most or have the most experience, but I promise you there's a lot that we can be bringing to the table. Um, and when given the opportunity, we can rise up and be able to make the change that we want to make. Yes, I love that. Take a chance. Take a chance on them. Natalia? Something that I've learned from the woman in my life is that empathy is key. A lot of times we'll judge a bully, but we don't consider that the bully may be being bullied. And so it's important to to ask ourselves, what, what are they going through? How can we help them? Instead of shaming them, um, how can we help them? How can we better support them emotionally in order to become a better person instead of punishing them? Um, and something that I think I would change is um, to not underestimate each other um, and not 
not diminish our work just because we're younger than you, um, or not diminish our ideas because we're younger than you. I think a lot of times it'll actually benefit everyone if you hear from our ideas because they're, they may be different than yours and we may have a different perspective. And I think that both hearing both sides of the stories, your perspective and our perspective, are both important, but we can't have one without the other. Mm, great. And I think finally what I learned from all of you is that there actually is such a close community of change makers like right here and I'm sure everywhere else and I think it's something I haven't really experienced before just like walking in yesterday morning and everyone's singing and everyone clapping and supporting each other it's just so new to me and it's so great to experience that so I'd say something that I would change is hopefully in the future there can be more girls at conferences like this to be able to experience these moments that we have together wow oh thank you so much um, well, oh, and now I just got three more minutes. I guess we can do our rapid fire. Um, do you guys want to do it? Okay, you gals want to do it? Um, okay, in one word, tell me how the feminist movement can be more accepting and embracing of younger voices. I can start. Yeah. I think positive is really important, positivity. Mm -hmm. We talked about a lot, a lot of issues yesterday and problems today, and I think just talking more about solutions, and that kind of goes back to climate change, just looking more to the future positively and encouraging mm -hmm. us, that would be nice. Mm -hmm. um, I would say love because I think it's so much easier to be nicer to each other. It's so hard to be mean. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't understand like why so many women, they kind of just feel like this competition towards each other. So I think instead of having that tension, I think it's important to love each other. And again, like considering where we all come from, I think asking ourselves, is this person doing okay? How can I help them? Instead of wanting to be better than. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd say trust. Mm. Um, yesterday we talked a lot about just being the first to do something, but I feel like in order to have those, to continue having these firsts and to continue perpetuating like the feminism movement, it's important to invest in the youth and trust that we, are learning mm -hmm. everything that we need to learn in order to step up in the future years and take mm -hmm. action for the causes that we're passionate about. Yes, love it. I'm telling, I'm being told to wrap up on porch. Um, Tanya, Natalia, Ming Shin, thank you so much. Uh, teenage girls are the most underestimated superpower and now you know why, because they're so powerful. Uh, so thank you so much for spending um, your, our, our, your last time with us um, and bring back their thoughts to your communities. Thank you, lady. Please welcome Jamie Frazier and Elizabeth Bonell. Oh my gosh. Okay, I know everyone has flights to catch, lunch 